Hello everyone, Eric Chappell, Civil Community Evangelist for Autodesk. I want to welcome everyone today to our webcast, Introduction to Swept Path Analysis with Autodesk Vehicle Tracking. Our uh, star of our show today will be Nigel Peters, uh, Software Development Manager, also Product Owner for Autodesk Vehicle Tracking. So you really couldn't be hearing from anyone better than, uh, than Nigel himself. Um, but before we jump into Nigel's presentation, I want to tell you about a few things. First, uh, if you're new to our webcast series, this is something we've been doing for uh, going on three years now. We do it twice a month, try to shoot for the first and third Wednesdays of the month. And our goals are to inform you about our civil products, features that maybe are coming out, or in this case, give you an introduction. Uh, you know, we have a feeling we, we've got a lot of customers who maybe know about vehicle tracking but haven't actually dove into it yet or given it a try, and we thought this was a good opportunity to give you the information you need to, to make that happen. Um, it's also a chance for you to ask questions and provide feedback. Uh, I have a slide about you know, how we encourage that during the webcast coming up. And um, you know, just generally speaking, we want to bring you folks, the users of our products, a little closer to the makers of our products. We want to tell you about, uh, usually I'm only talking about one upcoming webcast, but we've got an extra special webcast going on this month. On Valentine's Day, February 14th, we're having a webcast about virtual reality. So immerse yourself in your infrastructure project, Intro to VR. John Sayers is going to be presenting that. And if you're interested in that and you'd like to register, <clears throat> you can go right now uh, or after the webcast to autodesk.com slash VR dash webinar. The URL is right up there on your screen. And that's autodesk.com slash VR dash webinar. That's, like I said, a special event. Um, it's already got uh, a huge amount of activity around it. We've got a lot of people registered, something you're definitely not going to want to miss. Um, everyone's buzzing about VR these days, and, and it applies to infrastructure as well. And then as far as following the normal series, um, two weeks from now would be Wednesday, February 21st. <clears throat> and on that day, Buddy will be presenting uh, on Plant 3D for, for water and sewer treatment plants. So if you or your company do these kinds of projects, water and sewer treatment, and, you, and you've been wondering, you know, how does Plant 3D fit into that type of project, this is your chance to, to find out exactly that. We want to know what you want to see uh, for upcoming webcast series. So if you've got any ideas, please put them in the questions panel in your GoToWebinar interface. Um, every, after every webcast, we download a log of all the questions and answers, so we'll have those topics saved. And then when it, when it comes time to plan out future webcasts, we'll go ahead into there and see what kinds of suggestions you guys have come up with. So um, we get some great ideas from, from you folks, so please don't hesitate if you've got a good idea. Um, throw it in there either now or any time during the webcast. Just put it in the questions, questions panel, uh, your idea for an upcoming webcast. I want to call your attention to the Civil, Civil Engineering Community Center website. The URL is civil-community.autodesk.com. Um, this has been live since last August or September, and um, <clears throat> we're, we're seeing uh, viewership grow on this monthly um, it's becoming a really popular uh, hub for all kinds of information related to uh, Autodesk civil engineering products. So definitely want to check it out. It's, it's a central hub for news, forum posts, the gallery, um, tips and tricks. A lot of people go up for, for the tips and tricks. There are new ones every day. Uh, learning, learning content, new stuff every day. Just a great, get, great page to bookmark and visit at least daily um, because there's always new stuff up there. I don't know if we're going to get into anything that we're working on as far as preview or labs features, but in the, in the event that it does come up, just know that anything that we talk about that we're currently working on that hasn't been released, there's no guarantee that it's going to be released until you actually see it, and please don't make any purchasing decisions based on anything that we say we're working on and haven't released yet. That's the gist of this slide. We encourage you to ask lots of questions. Um, Nigel, Nigel and I were talking before the webcast. He's going to pause in a few spots to, uh, to look at some of the questions that have come up in the questions window. Unfortunately, our, our audience is way too large to allow the phone lines to be open for questions. So um, the more questions, the better. So please don't hold back. We encourage you to enter, enter your questions into the questions pane, and there are going to be multiple opportunities throughout Nigel's uh, presentation where he's going to stop and address some of those questions. 
I've got a quick poll that I want to throw out there at you. <clears throat> I just want to find out your usage level of uh, Autodesk vehicle tracking at this time. So go ahead and provide your answer to this poll. We're trying to figure out what your usage level is, ranging from I don't even have it, I think maybe our company has it, the whole way down to uh, I use it often. And I'll let that open for, um, for 10 seconds or so. So far, about 70% of you have voted. I'd like to get that up to about 75 or 80%. <clears throat> All right, good. I'm going to close that poll. And then I'll show you the results, kind of see what our audience looks like today. 19% um, don't have it at all. 10% aren't sure. 23% have it but don't use it. 36% use it every once in a while. And 12% use it often. I'd say that's a pretty good, um, <clears throat> pretty good place to be as far as an audience goes and the nature of our uh, presentation today. Uh, at this point, I'm going to give the floor over to Nigel, and he's going to take you through Introduction to Swept Path Analysis with Autodesk Vehicle Tracking. Nigel, you are now the presenter. Right, so hello everyone. I am Nigel Peters. I am the product owner for Autodesk Vehicle Tracking, and I lead the team that manages it and updates it. Uh, I am based in the UK, so I'll just give the usual warning. Uh, I'm British. I speak British English, so I might refer to pavements. When I call them pavements, they are sidewalks in the American. So there are my, the odd thing that I might use the British term. I try very hard not to, but it does come up occasionally. Okay. Today's talk is about using vehicle tracking to carry out some swept path analysis of two cranes into a construction site and to validate the vehicles of a new intersection. The aim of the talk is just to give you an introduction to using vehicle tracking on a couple of very common use cases. And in this, I'm going to use the vehicle wizard to change a standard library vehicle to meet the requirements that the actual physical construction vehicle has. So it's a very brief discussion on how to use vehicle tracking for two common use cases. So before I start, I'd like to just basically say what swept path analysis is. Swept path analysis is a design check system to prove vehicles can actually use the design you've produced. It is a common planning requirement, especially in Europe and in the States, to prove that vehicles that could are likely to be accessing the site, especially during construction, can actually get onto the site and to highlight places or difficulties such that would require the road to be closed to get the vehicle on the site. One thing about vehicle tracking, Autodesk vehicle tracking, is it is available to all AEC collection users. You can install it, you can use it, you're licensed to use it. The way vehicle tracking works is it is basically as easy as drawing a polyline. You're driving a vehicle by pointing and clicking. So I'll just give you a quick demonstration of how easy it is. Vehicle tracking has its own menu once it's installed, and we're using the tools up here, just the driving tools. It also has two other modules, sweat parking and roundabouts, but we are using the driving tools. It ships with about one and a half thousand design and real vehicles from around the world. Today we're going to use Ashto vehicles plus a two cranes from elsewhere in the world for the demo. But basically you select the vehicle you want to drive, in this case a WB20. Auto drive arc, you place the vehicle and you click and the vehicle will drive to where you click. It can turn onto a bearing and it will turn and go straight towards the cursor. It will turn as tightly as possible 
and straight towards the cursor. Once you've finished driving, the path will place grips the same way as you have on a polyline, and you can pick up any of the grips and edit the path. But it is basically that easy to drive. This vehicle here is being driven at five miles an hour and doing maneuvers based on a five mile an hour drive to the target points you have selected. So, the science behind all this, I'm just going to give you a couple of, or four slides I think it is, on the science and a few slides on the pitfalls of it. In vehicle tracking terms and swept path terms, all vehicles are bicycles. We simplify a, we, we reduce the a vehicle, doesn't matter how many front or rear axles, we reduce it down to a bicycle, where the front axle, the steered axle, is the centroid of the front axles, and the rear axle is the centroid of the rear axles. When it's driving in steady state, it all the axles, all points on the vehicle go round a circle, and they all have exactly the same center point. Multiple circles going round the same center point. We can even handle rear steered axles is exactly the same as going in reverse a rear steered vehicle. And trailers. Well, they're still bicycles, except they haven't got a front wheel. They just connect to the unit in front. It's quite common now, especially with the large construction vehicles, to have vehicles that have got both rear and front steering. Again, they model exactly the same as bicycles. I wouldn't want to actually ride a bicycle where both wheels steer. But the effect is you create a virtual third axle and forget about the, the rear axle. And that location of that virtual third fixed axle is based on a ratio of the wheel angles or a few other rules. But once you've worked out where the virtual middle axle is, it behaves exactly the same as a normal bicycle with front steering. There's no difference. So once you've worked out the spine vehicle, this bicycle, we just move it by moving it forward at small steps, typically one foot long step lengths, and we calculate where the axle, the, the steered wheel would travel going around the circle. We then effectively drag the rear wheel around its cutting point, and we just keep repeating that, dragging the tractor, dragging its trailers, to produce the path. So going from steady state to steering. Steering is applied as each step. So if we are using, there are three me common methods for handling steering. The first method is shown in most of the documents and standardization you have. So ashtos, swept path, turning circle diagrams are all based on circular arcs. So the front axle, the steered axle follows a circular arc. Another common way that occurs around the world is lock to lock distance. So the vehicle will go from full left lock to full right lock over a set distance. Neither of these examples are speed related. And using an arc turn or a lock to lock distance does not produce compound turns very well. To consider speed, if you know the lock to lock time and you know the speed the vehicle is going, traveling, you know how many degrees the wheel can be turned of every foot of travel. So you just keep applying extra lock as you drive. Not only does this give you a speed related turn, but it improves massively the effect on compound turns where you're doing an S-bend or you are doing a bearing turn where you're taking the hands off the wheel to straighten up. So most swept path analysis that you see in standardization documents will be using a non-speed related diagram. Most swept path analysis done around the world for planning applications is now done speed based. 
So someone's asked, how is it different to order turn? They're exactly the same. They're using the same method, the same system. Uh, vehicle tracking will produce the same paths order turn creates if you define exactly the same vehicle. So in order to model this, some, some fairly fundamental assumptions have been made. The bicycle that we produce, there is no skidding or tire slipperage. The tires are in contact, is infinitely small. It's a single point of contact. The single and front axles are reduced to a single axle. Steering wheels on fixed axles are controlled by perfect Ackerman linkages, which is how we can get away with reducing it down to a bicycle. The drawbar trailers have a single axle at the end. Again, we are reducing the drawbar trailer to a basically a bicycle. And fundamentally, turning left or turning right, the curb to curb turning radius is the same in both directions. I do know of a few mining trucks, in particular, especially specialist mining trucks in Australia, where the left hand turn circle is significantly different to turning right. So given those assumptions, in the real world, you have other issues. You have the difference between a lightly loaded vehicle and a heavily loaded vehicle. You have wet surfaces, you have cross fall, you have super elevation and slopes. Some work has been carried out to see the effect of those on swept paths. Basically, a rear steered, a front steered multiple axle tractor will, will towing a loaded trailer will, will probably have half a meter bigger turning circle in either way. So the cutting might be bigger or the uh, extent of the circle, the water wall of the circle might be half a meter difference. If it's a wet surface, it could be up to a meter difference. And if it's, if it's wet and flea laden, you could get up to one and a half meters difference. So when you are doing your sweat path analysis, allow for extra space. The road conditions will affect the results. Design vehicles are not actual real vehicles. Other vehicles will be different. Oddly enough, the assumptions we've made, if it's a single real, a single axled trailer or a single axle truck, there's negligible difference if you have got these. The reason the multiple rear axles make a difference is they're fixed and they start to scrub. They're not following perfect circles. So they always do some extra pull on the track trailer. Okay, so I've briefly mentioned design vehicles, so Ashto, etc., and pretty much every DOT around the world and local authority will have a series of design vehicles. We ship with about a thousand of them in the product. These design vehicles are typical vehicles of named types that you can expect to find in traveling on the roads. So large cars, small cars, trucks, semis. They are not real vehicles. Their dimensions and turning parameters are often 95 percentile of the current road fleet. They do get updated. Sometimes they stay the same for 10 years. Sometimes they get updated with every release of Ashto. There are quite often minor changes. Please make sure that you're using the vehicle that is required for the planning authority you have. And in America, you will find that Ashto have published some vehicles. Your state will have some vehicles. And sometimes your county will have vehicles. They can be very significantly different. Again, you don't just test with a single vehicle. You will test with multiple vehicles for every intersection. Again, the other issue, very common, we, I regularly, as in probably about once every two weeks, someone will send me a design vehicle to add to the library. And it will be something like 
a curb radii vehicle where a table in Ashto is saying this vehicle has a curb radii of 45 meters but it's got no details the other most common one that I get asked for is axle loading vehicles so these these vehicles show what looks like a design vehicle show most of the details they never have turning circle data and they never have all the data you need to define the vehicle but users assume because it's a design vehicle that it is for swept paths again not all vehicles are for swept paths from the ashto handbook again as as it implies real vehicles are exactly as the name implies they exist a daf truck a ford truck a semi it's an actual vehicle typically a Ford vehicle that's supposed to emulate a WB20 might be a little bit bigger, might have axles in a slightly different place, will have slightly different turning circle characteristics, but will be basically fairly similar. We would also get cases when you're doing swept path analysis where your local authority, particularly fire uh, authorities, require you use or prove that their fire fleet can get to the act get to the site this is very common for uh, mall designs or shop designs or in the UK if you are more than 50 meters from the main road you have to be able to prove that the local fire gate engine or tender can get to within a set distance of the property so it is most of the time when you're doing swept path analysis use design vehicles but be aware that you might want to use a real vehicle for some, some use cases. Okay, so as I said, we get a margin of error and issues concerning when the road is wet, when the vehicle is heavy loaded or not. It is always advisable not to use the actual raw sweat path. So in this diagram here, the raw swept path of the wheels is the red line. Slightly outside it, where the cursor is pointing at the moment, is the body. But the green line is another 300 millimeters further out. It is mandatory in Australia to have a clearance envelope, this large envelope further out, to allow for different road conditions, different drivers the fact that the design vehicles are not actual vehicles but are 95 percentile vehicles the green line allows for a margin of error a margin of inconsistency when the actual vehicle does the driving it is particularly important when you're doing analysis and you've got street furniture to avoid with abnormal loads that you do have an additional clearance envelope I quite regularly see sweat path analysis planning applications where no extra clearances has been allowed and you look at it and there is no way in reality a vehicle can get down that road okay so I'm just going to pause that's the end of the horrible theory bit uh, and see if there are any questions Right, okay, so someone is asking about turn on the spot. Uh, turn on the spot is where you allow the wheel to turn when you're stationary. It, my advice for turn on the spot is yes, you can use it, but I would only use it if this is a one-off maneuver. So if you are bringing a crane or a construction vehicle onto site and you need to use turn on stop to spot to get a tighter turn yes drive up do turn on the spot warn the authorities that you are using turn on the spot and turn the wheel and turn tightly if you are using turn on the spot at the start of a path so selecting the optimum steering wheel for the maneuver or using turn on the spot at every time you change direction 
two things will happen. One, you well, three things. The results will mean that you are turning, are producing a much better, much smaller turning circle. Turn on the spot effectively means you are doing the maneuver at zero speed. So you've just lost all your speed uh, capabilities. Secondly, if you own the road surface, you will get very cross with every driver doing a delivery turning on the spot because your road surface will get damaged very quickly. If you own the truck fleet, you will get very upset because you'll have to replace the tires far more regularly. Turn on the spot ruins tires and ruins road surface, especially on a heavily loaded vehicle. So do not use it unless it is a one-off because that's the only way you can get a construction vehicle onto site. Uh, right, so we've got a couple of queries about Revit. It is possible to export the lineage and bring that into Revit. It is not currently possible to use vehicle tracking natively inside Revit. And at the moment, there are no plans to do that. So someone is asking whether vehicles can be simulated around roundabouts. Uh, so yeah, okay, I'll, I'll see if I can do a turn on the spot example. So it's, if I do an auto, if I do an auto drive arc, vehicle going straight ahead, proceed, turn on the spot. That's the vehicle turning on the spot. No. OK, so if I now do exactly the same thing, st same vehicle, starting at the same point, starting in the same direction, and proceed. But don't turn on the spot. It's producing a wider curve. And this is a pretty simple example. So the two vehicles, that's probably about half a vehicle's width on this particular vehicle at this current speed settings. The other thing, so there's a query about the difference between auto turn. Uh, auto turn does enable turn on the spot. Auto turn will set the vehicle steering the same as turn on the spot does by default. So when you start a path, the first corner you make, first turn you make with auto turn, it will effectively turn on the spot straight away. We, we don't do that. We only turn on the spot if you enable it. So yes, there is an option to turn on a set so if you go to roundabout vehicle properties, sorry, and go to reports, and you go to body outline, edit, the two, the offset envelopes. So this is a two foot offset envelope. Let's delete the other path so it's a little bit clearer. Nope. So that's added a two foot clearance envelope to the truck and you can do a clearance envelope for the body and you can do a clearance envelope for the wheels separately. Okay, any, uh, just quickly run down the questions. No, okay, I'll go back to carry on. Have missed seconds. Okay. So the next next thing I want to talk about is an example demo 
is oh sorry there's another question uh turning on the spot for reversing it is not good practice when you are doing a maneuver you drive forward and then you you reverse and at the point you go from being forwards to reverse you do a turn on the spot uh yes you can in vehicle tracking enable turn on the spot uh if you use turn on the spot anywhere on a path and you do a design check you'll be warned that you've used it and asked to justify it uh, but it can be used for reversing equally we we try to reverse at two and a half miles an hour in reverse a model at that speed right so here's a fairly old it's a pretty standard uh, intersection model I can't remember where I got it from it was one of the order desk demo ones so here I'd like to validate that a this Arctic the WB20 can get round some of these maneuvers so first of all I place the vehicle somewhere sensibly on the road where I want to start driving and in this particular case I want to drive forward I'm doing a fairly rough and ready maneuver so here with a few clicks I have produced a maneuver that shows that it's pretty much possible but I've hit the curb here so I need to go back and adjust the maneuver these lanes in this example are very close to the maximum width that they need to be and I need to adjust that target point ever so slightly so I've proved that the vehicle should be able to do the maneuver without hitting the curb but it does take the entire road so this isn't a maneuver that I would be really happy asking WB20s to do on a regular basis again doing a similar maneuver from the this side to get place place the truck drive forward and again drive out but that that is made up of just arc maneuvers it's a lot easier to start again do an auto drive arc place the truck proceed drive forward turn onto a bearing so I'm probably I'm doing it this isn't the easiest way of doing it or the best way but I'm just editing the vehicle very simply and demonstrating here again this is a urban intersection it is not designed for heavy vehicles as a planner I would not really be happy with WB20s driving around here it's the middle of a town but it does show that it is possible for these vehicles to do but do the maneuver and you can do as many maneuvers as you want in the drawing using as many vehicles as you want so again I could go and select a different vehicle to drive so I could do a, a an intercity bus let's do a, a, a bus 12 12 meter long bus drive drive arc again the bus going around the corner so with a little bit of finesse you can get the bus going around the corner again it's not a very sensible vehicle here it is not this these results show that this intersection is not at all well designed for large vehicles it is a small car mainly focused intersection
So are there any questions on using swept paths here on the intersection design and checking? So I've got a query about, can we do it for multiple vehicles? One thing you can't do is once you've done the maneuver, you can't change the vehicle. The vehicles are following a spiral corner based on the shape of, or the wheelbase, and the lock-to-lock -lock time, and the amount of steering the vehicle has. So the spiral is always as tight as possible. So if you change the vehicle after you've done a maneuver, unless that vehicle can turn tighter and faster, it will not be able to follow the same path. So a couple of things on the parameters. This vehicle, if I pick the bus and do properties, this, this vehicle was tracking the frontmost axle, so the target point was the frontmost axle. I could have tracked to the left and the right. I could have tracked any point on the body. The closer the point is to the rear axle, the harder it is for the software to resolve the, the, the target and get, drive to hit the actual target. We, can, we have a nominal storage interval, which is just under a foot in this case. You can limit the steering that you use to say, I only want to use 80% of the available steering of this vehicle. You can never go above 100%. You can limit the steering angle to a fixed angle. So if you are limiting it to 30 degrees, that limit is maintained. It, if the vehicle can only actually turn at 24 degrees, it won't go above 24 degrees steering. The limit is of the physical vehicle or the limit you put on here, or you could limit the steering to an actual radius. You could say, I don't want the vehicle to steer less, or travel around a radius of less than, say, 40 meters. And as long as the vehicle can steer, you know, it won't, won't turn tighter than 40 meters. You can also limit the steering rate. So if lock to lock time says that the turn rate takes six seconds, you can limit that down as a ratio and you can limit the trailer articulation. So by default, the trailer is gonna have probably a 90 degree max articulation, depending on what the standard says. But you can limit that again to say, I don't want the vehicle to have used more than 75% articulation. We have two speeds. We drive, usually typically we drive at five miles an hour or five kilometers an hour forwards, and we reverse it two and a half. You can put any value you want there. The higher value you have for reversing, the harder and the less likely it will reverse correctly. Right, we, so a couple of queries here. We allow you to change the spiral and curve definitions. So the design standards used a tangential arc, circular arc. So you could actually say, I want the vehicle to follow that arc and not be speed based. We base it on lock to lock time as general, but you could also do a lock to lock distance. So you can actually control how it is. And we also allow turn on the spot and set optimum steering angle at start of path. The set optimum steering angle at start of path is what, what auto turn does. Again, dynamics. Sweat path analysis and the algorithm works or is proved to work for below 15 kph speeds. If you go above that, you will be warned that you need to set dynamics. And we currently have the Ashto dynamics built into the software. So you can limit the turning circle radius for high speed maneuvers to conform to Ashto's dynamics rules. Can you simulate speed dynamics to review best and worst case? Uh, no, we're not currently analyzing. I'm assuming from that the question is about slippage and toppling. 
Uh, we're not currently analyzing slippage and toppling. We need to know a, a bit more about the vehicles, design vehicles for best and worst case, need to know the center of gravity. And almost no design vehicles define where the center of gravity is for the truck or trailer. And the center of gravity moves depending on the loading of the trailer. We've looked at it. The equations are very simple to do. As you need a surface, you need a friction factor for the road surface and the center of gravity. So we, we looked at it. I'd like to do it, but we haven't done it yet. We don't allow locking of any of the settings at the moment. I've had a couple of requests to restrict and lock uh, issues in the drawing. We do, do have a design check tool. which will analyze the paths and look for issues that you are where we feel you are using bad practice. So here, in this case, we warn you users that if they go above 95% of the physical steering angle in any maneuver, that can they please give us a reason that they're, they're turning so tightly. Uh, it's generally not good practice to take a vehicle to its extremes. So the design check will analyze all vehicle tracking objects in the drawing and give you a list of potential issues, all of which can then be justified and signed off on. Any other questions? There's a query about 3D and 2D. Vehicle tracking is primarily a 2D tool. It is usually done on 2D drawings. We do so. We do allow you to analyze whether or not your vehicle traveling on a 3D surface will ground. You can't use design vehicles for that. You need to, or you'll be warned if you use design vehicles because the side profiles are wrong. You'll need to specify a more accurate model of the vehicle to get a good result or an accurate result. But if you've got a surface, you can analyze very quickly the vehicle running across that surface to whether or not it will ground. Accuracy of that is the vehicle will definitely be able to make the maneuver. But I would do several runs on with the same vehicle over the ground just to make sure that you are make, analyzing correctly and everywhere, because there is a slight difference in the positioning of the vehicle from the 2D as a 3D onto a 3D projection. Right, so this product, we do ship a few trams. It has a light rail module, so it will drive a vehicle, a tram, along the center line of a railway track. It does not perform cant, and it's not suitable for heavy rail, but it is suitable for light rail, and we do have, I think there's 10 example trams in the product. It also ships with a series of aircraft, some of which are very detailed designed with jet blasts and uh, wind blasts and sounds and service vehicles. Right, so someone's asking about the bump. I haven't got a surface in this drawing, and I haven't got a sample I can sh readily share at the moment. But we do have a ground conflict report, which will run the vehicle along the surface. You specify the surface and the swept path, but you need to define an accurate side profile of the vehicle. It assumes rigid tires and rigid suspension but it does handle the suspension and the cross twist and yaw of the vehicle as it travels on the surface. So any other questions? Okay, I will carry on very quickly. The next bit of the I was going to discuss is 
this area here is a proposed site. So I want to analyze getting this large crane onto the site. This is a very odd crane. It's got multiple steerings. It's got, I think, 10 axles. It's a very large, very hard to drive crane. And I want to prove that it can get onto the site or what alterations need to be made to get this crane on the site. And then I'm going to take the large mobile crane and very quickly use the wizard to change some of the specification of the crane and then drive it onto the site. So, first of all, I want to get the cranes so I can 1550, let's just search for the crane. World Ride Wheel Vehicles. So I want to drive this, Auto Drive Arc. So I'm going to place it on the road. Start again. So I'm going to reposition it so that it's actually on the road. And I'm going to just proceed and try and drive it in. So this, as you can see, it's the, the crane has got four front steered axles, two fixed central axles, and three rear axles. And it is a very large and unwieldy crane. And it's only just able to get on site. So here, I'm hitting the I'm hitting the central reservation, which is not a good move. So if I move the vehicle over, I am definitely with this vehicle going to have to close the road and manually guide it into site, and I'm definitely going to have to remove some of the curb to get this vehicle onto site. But it is possible to get it on the site, and it is possible if I close the road, or temporarily close the road or block both lanes, to do it without damaging the central reservation. So, not ideal, but it is a big crane, and that crane would only come onto site probably once or twice in the construction of the site. So I think I could go to the local authority or the county council and ask them for permission to close the road, showing them this swept path, showing them that the vehicle can get on site. So the other task I wanted to do is show you very quickly Go to the mobile crane. I think it's right, the large mobile crane. This crane is very similar. So what I'm doing is I'm going to use the vehicle wizard to change this vehicle, this crane, to something that's similar to the one that I know is coming to site. And the one that's coming to site is 14 meters long. So it's another two meters longer than this one. It's got a 7-meter wheelbase, not a 4-meter wheelbase. It's got a 12-meter curb-to-curb, and it's got a 5-meter rear overhang from the rear of the body. So I'm going to just do an edit a copy. And I'm just going to do this, uh, give it a different name. It's still one unit. It's still a crane. It's still got the same number of front axles and its same track width, but the width of the vehicle hasn't changed. The wheelbase, in my example, I'm going to make seven meters, but I'm going to keep the axles the same. So change that. The wheelbase is now grown to seven meters. The lock-to-lock -lock time is still exactly the same. Turning circle, I've been told it's 12 meters. So just update that to 12 meters. Again, it hasn't got any front any couplings. The length of the body is 14 meters and the rear overhang 
is five meters. So it's got a really big overhang out the back. So it's going to swing out a lot when I drive it. But this is the specification of the vehicle I was given by the owners of the train. And I decided instead of defining it from start, I decided to actually just use a very similar vehicle and drive it the same. So most of this data is available from either the crane owners, the crane manufacturers. Unfortunately, it is quite often you have to fight and push quite hard to get all the information you need. But the wizard will guide you through what information you need. So I've finished that vehicle, so I'm just going to drive it again, drive or to drive arc. I'm going to come in from this this direction just to save me deleting the. And again, turn onto a bearing into the site. And again, here this entrance is totally useless for this particular crane. The the rear overhang sticks out the cut in and this is ideal we should of course allow probably another foot or two foot to drive a maneuverability this is an exact size of the of the crane but i'd have to cut up quite a lot of the curb to get this vehicle in okay i'm going to sort of wind up now as we're coming towards the end of the hour and i know i need to hand back any questions We have a few minutes for another question or two, Nigel, if you want to field any of those. Okay, so what's come in? So, yes, lots of jurisdictions don't provide complete data. Uh, I know in the UK we have a design document produced by the Freight Transport Association. It actually lists about 20 design vehicles, 12 of which they only supply rudimentary data. They tell you you've got to specify and check for those vehicles, but they don't supply enough data to actually model the vehicle in swept path. If you're looking at real vehicles, it is very, very common that you'll get the wheelbase, you'll get the axle spacings, you'll get the width, length of the body, possibly the size, including wing mirrors. You might get turning circle, but it will just say turning circle. It won't tell you if it's the wall to wall or curb to curb. Wall to wall is the turning circle produced by the body curb to curb is produced by the wheels and ironically it is very common that you will not be told what the front or rear overhang is so the different distance from the axles to the front bumper or the rear bumper so you know the length and size of the body but you don't know how it sits on the actual vehicle again I've known cases where we've physically gone out to measure that distance sometimes you can take it off the pictures and diagrams that they supply uh, if you do that, please add a comment when you define the vehicle and let your customers and, and users know that you have guesstimated or, or estimated that distance. So why would you use multiple maneuvers to get to, to get on site? Uh, I would use multiple maneuvers knowing what the construction fleet that's coming onto the site and it's usually the construction fleet once you've designed it the only real vehicles you need to prove can get there are fire tenders refuse trucks and delivery lorries but in construction you'll get really quite large vehicles sometimes so you might be required to prove that all conceivable construction vehicles can get on the site it's not uncommon for design site documents to have up to 20 swept paths getting on and off the site. So you need to prove that the vehicle can not only get into the site, but can also leave the site and whether or not you need to close the road to do that. Sharing vehicles around customers. Uh, vehicle tracking does have the ability in settings to define a network share drive and it will cache any fold any files you put on the network share drive can be cached so if you if you place your libraries 
So you create a library, save the library. You can lock the library by setting up a user and making all other users read only. It's a simply passworded protected. Once you've got your library, you place it on the network share and you configure your vehicle tracking users to point to that network share. And they will get the vehicles in their library when they open vehicle tracking. So are there any other questions? We're getting close to the top of the hour. Nigel, I'm going to take okay. back the screen here. Yep. I'll hand it back to Eric. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to remind everyone about the uh, webcasts that are coming up. The first one on uh, February 14th, I actually had the wrong time on the initial slide. It's 1 to 2 Eastern, so an hour later than this time slot. Uh, on February 14th, John Sayer is going to be the presenter. He's an excellent presenter and a good friend of mine. He's a very, uh, very animated and passionate presenter. You're going to love hearing from him. Um, and he's going to talk about um, using VR in infrastructure projects. And to register for that, you need to go to the URL on your screen right now. It's uh, www.autodesk.com slash VR dash webinar. Or check your Facebook feed. We've been uh, announcing it on uh, Facebook and other social media outlets. You can find it there as well. And then in our regular series, our regular cadence on the 21st of February, 12 to 1 ET, same time as this one, we'll be hearing about plant 3D for water and sewer treatment plants. The information about registering for that webcast is not out yet, but it will be soon. So keep an eye on the community center, uh, civil-community.autodesk.com, as well as various, um, various social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, etc. Um, one slide I forgot to show you is this one. We saw from the poll that some of you uh, aren't currently using vehicle tracking. You don't have it, or maybe you're not sure if you have it. If you're interested in having someone from Autodesk reach out to you and talk about purchase options, you're going to have a survey that pops up at the end of the webcast, and that has all the information we need to, uh, to reach out to you and, uh, and talk to you about uh, the offerings that we have. So if you're interested in having someone reach out to you, just simply complete that survey. It's basic information, you know, name, name, email address, company name, that sort of thing. And then uh, someone from our sales staff will reach out to you and, and give you the information that you need. So with that, I want to uh, thank you all for giving us an hour out of your day today. Um, we hope to see you in the upcoming webcast that I uh, have made you aware of. I want to thank Nigel for giving us a great presentation, a great intro to uh, path analysis. I think we're going to see more from Nigel in the coming months, uh, more about vehicle tracking. We've been talking about doing a, a parking um, session next. Is that right, Nigel? Yes. So Yes, uh, I'm, I'm planning about a half hour webinar on parking. Great. So look forward to that. If you want to learn about another functionality set for vehicle tracking, uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking about that soon. So thanks again, have a great rest of your week, and we hope to see you on many future webcasts. Thanks again, Nigel. Bye-bye.